All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Molly Phillips. I work for the Blue and BioQuest projects and also work closely with um, the BCNet RCNUPE. Um, and we are, I'm here to, to share on behalf of my working group, which um, are here. Um, we met last summer at the Biome Institute, and we are working on a series of thin figures modules. And who we are is, we have Bun Mi from Allen University. Jen is joining, joined our working group from Agnes Scott College. Siobhan is all the way over in New Zealand, which makes our Zoom meetings really fun to organize. And she's a Wikimedian and data curator. Um, I'm from BioQuest and Blue, I already said that, Adania, who is going to actually be talking um, right after me about Black and Natural History Museums, is joining us from the Florida Museum. We have Sean, who's from Tennessee Tech, and then Mackenzie, who's also at the Florida Museum. And we all started um, this working group wanting to tackle um, hidden figures in natural history collections. And yeah, I guess I jumped ahead. This is my slide saying, yeah, we all met through Biome, which is a- um, Molly, Molly, I'm gonna interrupt you. Your slides yeah. are not being shared. Oh. <laughs> I know you like... made them, so I, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, I'm like going along. I like shared them, you know, internally, but not yet. All right, so let me go back. So you can see the people. I'm so silly. Oops. There we go. So here's the working group. Um, there's uh, Bun Mi, Jen, Siobhan, Dania, Sean, Mackenzie, and myself. And we found we found each other at the Biome Summer Workshop in 2022. And we are continuing working together with support from BCNet, which is Biological Collections and Ecology and Evolutionary Network. So I'm just going to briefly go over today the introduction to what a hidden figure is, um, talking about some of the ways that we're tackling it through storytelling and data sleuthing, and then summarizing our educational materials and where we're moving in the direction. So as we all know, natural history collections are, are such an important resource for biologists, and they hold so much amazing hidden and knowledge. Um, and a lot of the information, of course, we're getting is from labels uh, in natural history collections. Um, and there's lots of ways that we're digitizing that information, the label data, um, including projects like Notes for Nature and We Dig Bio and getting all of that um, really, really important field note and label data into databases, into aggregated information so we can reach them. Um, are what we're very interested in, in tackling though, or who are the collectors that are uh, making a lot of these historical collections? So right here we have, can anybody read that? Does anybody have a guess what that says? You can put it in the chat if you do, I'll open the chat. Wait a minute. All right, Mr. C-U-C James. Yeah, that's a good guess. I'm just gonna stop sharing for just a second. Oops, so I can see the chat. All right. Yeah, Mr. D. Yeah, Mrs. E Mrs. UC Janeiro. Okay, yeah. All right, so I saw some that were, were getting close there. So through a workflow that was created by Siobhan, she was able to data sleuth that it reads Mrs. O.C. James, um, but that translates to this person, Rosa Samson James. Um, and so um, Rosa Samson James is an American scientific and botanical collector that lived from 1835 to 1924. Her spouse was Oliver C. James, which is where the O.C. comes from. 
So it gets, it's very tricky. All right, here, as we, we talked about, it gets even trickier, of course, because lots of people aren't even named. You know, Rosa was named by proxy of her husband, but many of us have heard of famous people in science, such as Charles Darwin or George Forrest, but far fewer know the stories of the local Nazi people who that assisted Forrest on his expeditions, or John Edmonston, who taught Darwin how to preserve bird specimens. Not only are these people left out of the stories, they're often left off with the labels. So the data is completely missing, not just tricky. And so that's another part that we wanted to talk about. We wanted, where we wanted to tackle, like, how can we, you know, help with hidden figures, both in issues like Rosa, and then issues um, like Rosa, and then issues like Edmonton. So there's countless examples, um, and the documentation is incomplete. Uh, and there's so there's some names we'll never uncover. Um, but we can share their stories, which provide insight and shared experiences of marginalized groups. So we started to develop a two-part workflow, which includes connecting people to the data when possible, and if documentation is missing, focusing on the story. So the first part I want to share with you is some storytelling. Um, these are just a couple of examples of some hidden figures in natural history. Um, George Washington Carver was an American scientist and an inventor and a professor at the uh, Tuskegee Institute. He is famous for his many contributions to agricultural knowledge and technologies, but he's also contributed to specimens and expertise to natural history collections throughout his year. So I feel like George Washington Carver is an example of someone who is rather famous, but his natural his connections to natural history collections isn't as well known. And then he, we also have Sosi uh, Letterlow, who began working in the Smithsonian um natural history museum in 1940 as an elevator oper operator because discriminatory private hiring practices prevented her from working in curatorial scientific capacity in the museum um she asked for and achieved a role in finally in entomological work eventually restoring hundreds of thousands of insects and classifying thousands she's co-identified 40 type specimens and in 1979 a mite was named in her honor However, like so many Black or African-American people today, we are missing documentation of her contributions. And these stories are being documented by Black and Natural History Museums, which we're going to hear more about, as well as our hidden figures. It's kind of where our collaborations are overlapping. Um, so here's the page for Sophie's on Black and Natural History Museums. So I really would um, encourage you to visit their website to see some of the stories that are already been putting, putting up to you know, highlight these hidden figures in science. So the really we wanted to leave on the like storytelling part is that the reason that a science you know, working group started to focus on stories is because um, Stories elicit an emotional response and students can benefit from stories being used in courses because that increases engagement and also increases learning and retention of information. Um, it also increases representation, um, which is really, really important as we know in science identity and um, in retention in STEM. Next, we're going to talk about the data side. <laughs> So these are all just brief overviews because yeah, we're still working out and creating the modules and they're not quite ready um, for review yet. But this module was created, this workflow was created by Siobhan Leachman. Uh, if anybody who doesn't know her, I'd follow her on Twitter. She's very active there and she shares her knowledge readily and with joy and she's an amazing person. But basically the basic workflow here is that you're starting with biodiversity literature, specimen labels, um, you know, looking in iNaturalist, or not iNaturalist, in places like Notes for Nature, et cetera, partnering with a museum. Maybe you are a museum and you're, you have your own biodiversity literature. You choose a person and then you start to collect uh, data about that person. And that's the part that we kind of largely call data sleuthing and is the hardest to describe and has takes the most time to learn because there's a lot of different places that you can be going to find information about a person living or dead. And that is a big, you know, and whether they're currently living or deceased, 
um, that completely changes the workflow from then on. If they're living, then they'll need to create their own ORCID ID um, and then add them to Binomia, which is a website that helps link natural history specimens to their collectors. Um, if they're deceased, then they can be added to Wikidata and you can create, so here's an example of George Washington Carver's Wikidata entry. Um, then they can still go be added to Binomia. You can attribute their specimens in Binomia, Binomia. And if they're deceased, then you can make their profile public on Binomia. If they're living, then once again, you have to create a, a connection, a collaboration, because there is privacy and all of that. Um, and we would definitely want people to be, feel empowered and share their data only if they want to. <laughs> so that is our basic flow of the uh, workflow basic flow of the workflow. Um, finally, I'm going to just do a basic overview of what educational activities we're building around these. Um, so we're building a course-based undergraduate education or course-based undergraduate research experience, CURE. The idea with these would be there's modules on each, you know, storytelling, binomia, data sleuthing, wiki data, and um, instructors and students can either use them in a chronological order and, and do a cure throughout the semester, or they can um, use any of our materials piecemeal as, as they see fit. Maybe they just want to focus on stories of hidden figures and they don't want to address, you know, go into the data workflow. So far, what we have our um, drafts that we're currently working for through an introductory module, which would basically introduce, introduce the whole workflow. And also very importantly, really introduce why um, natural history collections are needed and um, why natural uh, history museums have hidden figures and kind of the um, racial and colonial past of natural history collections. And we have them read a paper called Nat Nature Red and Black and White, Deep Colonial Approaches. And then they annotate and discuss that uh, paper in their class. And then we also have already a draft for an introduction to ORCID. And this has a student ac activity where the students make an ORCID themselves because what, part of what we really want this module to have is also not only be um, bringing hidden figures out to light, but also making sure students understand the importance of attribution and making sure that they get credit for the work that they're doing as students, um, even before they get their official careers, wherever they're going. And then on the horizon, we're going to be creating the importance of stories in science module, where we're going to have students uh, learn about why stories matter in science and then also be writing their own stories. Um, then we'll also have a module on becoming an internet sleuth, that kind of the part that I said in the workflow is the most complicated, learning on how to find information about people, deceased and living. Uh, and then we'll have an introduction to binomia using um, that to connect people with their specimens. And then finally, we'll have a module on editing and creating wicked data items. So some additional uh, opportunities, if this is exciting for you, we welcome anybody to join our working group. As we said, it's an informal working group. We're just getting these educational modules out there, uh, but also uh, reaching out to Savan Leachman. She would be happy to help you get started with becoming a scribe on Binomia. I would definitely say I can put the link in the chat once I stop sharing. You can find yourself on Binomia and make sure that your specimens are attributed to you. Um, consider participating in Biome. That's where we met. It was really, really fun. There is a like sister group to our Hidden Figures working group, which is called Ciceris, which is um, supporting these very same workflow and these tools um, in the professional community um, versus, you know, in undergraduate and graduate like education. Uh, BCNet, like we talked about, has a scholar program, which is what we're involved in, and that's where that link goes. So if you have something, a cure, because they're, they're focused on cure specifically, if you have a cure and you want support, um, I would highly recommend reaching out to them. And then Black and Natural History Museums, which we will talk about in 15 minutes. <laughs> so I think that is it. So I'm going to stop sharing and see if there are any questions or ideas. And thank you. Uh, 
while people are just starting to think about this, I'm going to put the link in Bionomia in the chat. I would love to hear if anybody has used Bionomia before. Um, yeah, and if they've, and if they haven't, you should definitely check it out and see if you're on there. And if you're not, you should add yourself. And I see Simona. I'm saying that your is your hand is raised. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, this was really, really interesting. I, I'm from uh, Royal Ontario Museum in uh, Toronto, Canada. And um, I actually um, take care of the uh, mycology collection. So I'm a little removed from animals, but um, a lot of interesting um, ideas came from uh, these discussions and presentations. Um, We've been doing something similar in-house, um, so nothing outreaching, but um, we're just putting together files for various collectors from our um, mycological um, collections. Um, and we started doing that because the information on the specimens wasn't sometimes wasn't enough information about the geographical location. Uh, so what we've started um, doing is uh, looking at the history of that particular collector, where they collected in various years, and this is how we we did a little bit of detective work to pinpoint the locations where they did collecting in various years because. Um, as you know, in um, North America, there are many places called exactly the same. And if you don't have the county or the state, it's very hard to tell where this happened. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in um, looking more at this binomia and maybe adding our data there, um, if that's possible. Um, it is unfortunate that right now it's just me. <laughs> Uh, as a sole representative of the mycology collections at the ROM, but I do have um, several extremely eager volunteers that could help. So I think we could expand that for um, a different set of collectors, people looking more at plants and, and fungi. Absolutely. So, and we would love to follow up with you and see if we could. Um, because once we get these modules into classrooms, you can definitely get some help getting them up on Bionomia um, with students. Um, actually, the bottleneck really is finding um, enough hands <laughs> to do. Yeah, well, no, the bottleneck actually is finding those collectors. So you have some collectors, but you need help getting them up and connected. That's actually what this module is going to be really good at. And the bottleneck will always, though, be is discovering the hidden figures because they're hidden. So that is yeah, definitely yeah. The, the bottleneck. So yeah, please reach out. We could definitely help you like make connections and um, find a, a classroom that would probably be really excited, maybe even local to you, that would be really excited to help you. Um, uh, sure, if you, if you can um, post your... Um, yeah, I'll put my email in the... Email or... That would be fantastic. And and my email is very simple. is Simona M in one word at rom.on.ca. So it's like <laughs> the simplest. I, you'll still have to write that down. <laughs> I put my uh, email in the chat though. And I'm also the person that has been sending you all the emails. So you can always reply to the like, yeah, I saw that. I wasn't sure if you're using the same email for other things or if this is just something created for this particular um, camp, which is was a great idea. I'm I'm quite happy I signed up for it. And now I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> no, this is awesome. These are the connections we're really hoping for demo camp because I'm I'm serious. Like you that you're the like solving a bottleneck for us. So we're excited to be able to potentially collaborate. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Great to meet you. <laughs> yeah, great to meet you as well. And I also saw someone was asking about the um, workflow 
and the slides. And I put a previous version, which really hasn't changed much because I gave this talk like just a little while ago, a little while ago. Um, I put that in the um, chat. So that has a citation and also the slides. Actually, I think I can find an even more today. So as still looking, I'm going to put another link in the chat that's an even more up to date um, version of the talk that anybody can use. We've open licensed it, but there's a way to cite it using that link. So that's always appreciated. Did anyone else have questions or comments for Molly or I guess any of the speakers that are still here before we shift over to Dania? Um, Molly, it looks like we do have one question about the recordings in the chat. Yes, yes, Angeli, the recordings I will be putting, posting them after the, the workshop, but I'll be posting all of the recordings by presenter um, on the website, the demo camp website. And I will